people in the Muslim world and around the world now, they don't trust the West. They don't trust the United States and the European Union and the British. They don't trust their media. They don't trust their think tanks. They don't trust their politicians because of what they have seen being done by those people and lying about what they are doing and then blaming others for crimes and mistakes they are making themselves, like accusing China of oppressing the Muslims while the United States itself was bombing and killing, and NATO, bombing and killing many, millions of Muslims around the world. I think the Arab countries turning to China for a possible alternative is a very encouraging sign for the global South seeking for their own independent and sustainable development for the future. And that is a modernization which we all want to see, right? Essentially, we're not only just having a one model, but multiple older, uh, models for uh, and multiple source of support that the global South could choose from is definitely a much more promising multiplicity of the future development of globalization. People in the West wake up to the fact that we are on a sinking ship. We need to jump to the lifeboats, and China is helping us <laughs> provide the lifeboat, say, look, there is a better alternative, which everybody will benefit from. And I think this is, I'm cautiously optimistic that this could succeed. Can China play a role mediating peace between Israel and Palestine? Hello, everybody. Welcome to Talk It Out with me, Li Jingjing. This episode, I hope to shine a light on some actions from China, which are aiming to solve the ongoing crisis between Israel and Palestine. First, as we are recording this episode, China's top diplomat Wang Yi is in New York. He will chair a meeting at the United Nations because in November, China is the rotating president of UN Security Council, and China will hold a Security Council high-level meeting on the Palestinian-Israeli issue on November the 29th. And before that, a delegation of foreign ministers from Arab and Muslim nations, including Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Palestine, visited Beijing to meet with Wang Yi in Beijing. And all these foreign ministers of Arab and Muslim nations hope China can play a bigger role solving the crisis. And also after that, at a BRICS extraordinary virtual meeting, Chinese President Xi Jinping also gave a speech and demanded immediate ceasefire. I also posted President Xi's key quotes of his speech on my Twitter. You can check it out. And for example, at the speech, President Xi calls for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and calling all parties to the conflict to stop and end their hostilities and achieve a ceasefire immediately, stop all violence and attacks against civilians, and release civilians held captive, and to act to prevent a loss of more lives and spare more people from more miseries. And China calls for an early convening of an international peace conference that is more authoritative to build international consensus for peace and work towards an early solution to the question of Palestine that is more comprehensive, just, and sustainable. And in his speech, he also pointed out the root cause of the ongoing crisis. He said, the root cause of the Palestinian-Israeli situation is the fact that the right of the Palestinian people to statehood, their right to existence, and their right of return have long been ignored. I have emphasized on many occasions that the only viable way to break the cycle of Palestinian-Israeli conflicts lies in the two-state solution, in the restoration of the legitimate national rights of Palestine, and in the establishment of an independent state of Palestine. There can be no sustainable peace and security in the Middle East without a just solution to the question of Palestine. So these are all the recent efforts, recent actions from China in solving the crisis. So what kind of role can China play? And what kind of role can BRICS play? So today, I invited two guests to join this discussion. Let me introduce them. First is Professor Yin Zhiguang. He's professor of international politics at Fudan University. He also taught at the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom before. His research lies in mainly the area of Chinese modern intellectual and legal history, ethnic minority policy, international relations, and Sino-Middle Eastern relations. 
So welcome, Professor In. Thank you for having me. And the next guest is an old friend of this show. His name is Hossein Asgri. He is the West Asia coordinator for the Shader Institute. He is of Iraqi descent, and he's also an expert on the Belt and Road Initiative. So, Hossein, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Jing Jing. It's my great pleasure to be with you again, and I say hello to Professor Ying. You know, I really want to hear your guys' thought on this topic because it seems like a lot of countries have put their hope on China to to mediate. Or at least de-escalate the tensions between Israel and Palestine. What's your take on this? How about we start with Hossein?、Uh, thank you. Well, I think what, what China is doing is really great. It's fantastic. It's、uh, it's using all its uh, uh, political, economic, and diplomatic power to reach a solution to this、uh, crisis, and、uh, it's really really appreciated. China is the most trustworthy partner in this whole region. Uh, we saw this with the Saudi-Iranian、uh, normalization process because it could bring these two partners because China is trustworthy mediator.、Uh, but the other thing is what makes China unique in this process is what、uh, the United, what China presented at the United Nations recently is the question of economic development. China is unique in that sense that、uh, you cannot separate security piece from economic development. But before we discuss that, I, let me just.、Uh, Point that certain we have to define the situation a bit、uh, better because there is no Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This is not two states fighting each other because there is no Palestinian state. Israel is an occupation power, and the people in Palestine are a resistance force, whatever their inclinations are. So there is there are no two states. What we need to have a two-state solution. Palestinians should have their own state, as China is demanding, and go back to the resolution 242 from 1967. So the, you have the ter- territory of Palestine,、uh, but also what what、uh, Israel is doing right now. I mean, it's it's a crime against humanity. It's war crimes and bordering on genocide. I can explain why this is the case, but also the fact that the Israelis never had the intention. Not all the Israelis, but mostly the right wing ones, the Likud、uh, party, the ex- right wing extremists. They never had the intention to have a Palestinian state. Their idea is to transfer the Palestinians, and this is what constitutes genocide: to move, or kill, or move all Palestinians from Gaza into the desert in Sinai and from the West Bank into Jordan. That what constitutes genocide, and there are very clear intentions and plans to accomplish that. So there was never ever an intention to have a Palestinian state, and this is what China is putting on the table again: say we need to have a two-state solution, and that the. State of Palestine should be viable in terms of economic, uh, uh, you know, viability. You need to build,、uh, and, and China can do that with the Belt and Road Initiative, with China's enormous in,、uh, capabilities. That could be done. So, just to clarify, that there is no Israel-Palestine conflict. This is an Israeli occupation、uh, suppressing an occupied people. Hmm. Uh, Professor Yin, what's your take on this? And what can I mean? What's the role for China or BRICS? How much impact can China or BRICS can have on this issue? First of all, I think I absolutely agree with what was saying to set.、Um, this is a、um, China could definitely play a much stronger role. But I want to emphasize that it's not only just China that plays a bigger role. It's actually China and the entire BRICS. I agree that the、uh, two-state solution is definitely the way out. But one thing we might have to ask is that after we really achieve that two states, what will happen? Because essentially, we realize that um, um, Israel and Palestine, Israel has never stopped its its its, inten- its expansion in West、uh, Palestine in、uh, in West Bank, and never stop its expansion its military action in Gaza. And or, despite the fact that there is a de facto a recognition of the state of Palestine、uh, among many of the states across the world, so in reality, even though we have achieved a ceasefire or we a treat a treaty a, a treaty a ceasefire a treaty a peace co- a treaty, we really have to work together with the surrounding countries to support the development of Palestine afterwards. And that cannot be achieved without a stronger global South unity, and that、uh, this is the element I want to emphasize on.
Sure, China plays a much bigger role nowadays, but this cannot be achieved without the collective support from the BRICS country, from the other surrounding Middle Eastern countries. We have already seen that uh, Turkey plays a uh, much important role in uh, delivering aid to, uh, to, to Gaza, so is Egypt. They have sacrificed, they've made a, a, a huge endeavor into delivering um, um, aid materials, living materials to Gaza, uh, the impacted, uh, impacted areas. At the same time, um, uh, the global society has sort of put on pressure on, 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 on states such as Egypt to say, why don't you just accept uh, refugees from, 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 from Gaza? And this needs to be responded with a collective initiative. We need to tell the world why Egypt would choose to do that uh, instead of just looking at um, this, this particular issue as if this is a state-to-state -state initiative, no. So therefore, to, 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 to summarize, I think the BRICS, it is quite, I want to bring people's attention to the statement uh, made by China on the platform of BRICS. It is the BRICS platform that allows us, or at least allows the global South to see that there is a possible alternative to the hegemonic, existing hegemonic world order. And BRICS, as a declaration, could do more. There, there's mm. one more, one complicating uh, factor here, which I think China can play a role. Uh, when President Xi Jinping was in San Francisco, I was telling my friends, I was guessing that President Xi must have brought the Palestinian issue to President Biden, because there's a fact here that only the United States can force Israel to end its aggressive policy and go back to a negotiation table. Only the United States can force Israel to do that. It's of course important that you have the global South, the neighboring countries uh, with China, the BRICS, they are good. but the Israelis will not listen to anyone but the United States because the United States controls the game in a sense because it provides the weapons and money to Israel. So if China can, as part of its dialogue with the United States, bring the United States into understanding that it's in the best interest of the United States and Israel and the Israeli people to have peace and end this military, uh, you know, insane policy, which has uh, continued for 70 years now in Israel. Right? And it, it created enormous suffering that Palestinians, Israel cannot survive in this environment. So the United States role is important in that sense. And China can in, with, in dialogue with the United States can bring the United States to a better understanding of what is in real interest of the United States and what is in the real interest of Israel. I want to ask you, you know, I think many, especially in the West atmosphere, they probably wonder how come Muslim nations, Arab nations put so much trust on China? Just like earlier this year when China mediated broker peace between Saudi Arabia and Iran, it was out of the blue, shocked the whole world. And you know, it shocked them also because of they spent so much money, so much effort uh, on information propaganda, trying to drive a wedge between China and Muslim nations. And it seems like all their efforts driving a wedge failed. So I, I think they must wonder how come Muslim nations put so much trust on China and this time a delegation of Arab and Muslim nations came to China um, hoping China play a bigger role mediating the peace between Israel and Palestine. So I mean, what's your thought on this? How come Muslim nations trust China? How about we start with uh, you, Hossein? Well, the fact is that people in the Muslim world and around the world now, they don't trust the West, they don't trust the United States and the European Union and the British, they don't trust their media, they don't trust their think tanks, they don't trust their politicians because of what they have seen being done by those people and lying about what they are doing and then blaming others for crimes and mistakes they are making themselves, like accusing China of oppressing the Muslims while the United States itself was bombing and killing, and NATO, bombing and killing many, millions of Muslims around the world. So the Muslim people around the world, they see what's going on, they see the reality, and also the fact that the truth from inside China is coming out, that actually the Muslim minorities in China are having 
the best time in their history and they are be, being prosperous. The government is taking care of them and the economic situation has changed dramatically, especially in Xinjiang and the Uyghur autonomous area. And the prospects of the future of the Muslims in China looks very, very bright because of Xinjiang will be the gateway to the whole Belt and Road Initiative expanding westward and having the, this recent uh, pilot uh, free economic zone. This is going to be a revolution uh, in the whole uh, Muslim uh, community there. So this is what people look at in the Muslim world. They see the difference and the, uh, now also the hypocrisy of the West, like what this Gaza situation have created. It completely discredited the Western, you know, claim super moral superiority and you know democracy and all this stuff now it's fully exposed you know, like the head of the eu was going to israel pushing israel you know to go get them biden the whole western world was pushing israel to retaliate against the poor palestinians and killing thousands of children and women and this is being seen by the whole world now and this is a very very big shift mm -hmm. professor Ian, what's your thought on this but I want to act on that, but bring in the third world perspective or the global south perspective. I mean, for a long time, um, the global south, at least since the 1980s, right? One of the main arguments proposed by the global north is that the, uh, the world has no alternative. That the famously coined, coined by uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher is say there is no alternative. The underlying implication is that apart from working together with our new neoliberal uh, order and its international order, the world has no other option. And the reality in the 1980s seems to, 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 to support that argument, right? That the decline of the Soviet Union, the rapid emergence of the global north, particularly with their uh, quick fix, the neoliberal quick fix, the economic seems to have an uh, upwing swing. And the implication to the global South at the time is that many of the global South countries really do see that the global North is the only viable option. And the world has been operated in that way, um, arguably for about 30 years. Now, finally, in the, uh, in the, in the second decade of the, 2000, uh, of the 21st century, the global South sees a possible, a viable alternative, which is kept, which is featured by the Chinese, a, success, a successful um, um, sort of uh, um, initiative, successful initiative in uh, um, pretend, uh, pro, pro, uh, uh, protecting itself from the trade war. So a trade war uh, waged by the United States against China has the aim of uh, demolish the rising Chinese uh, industrialization and modernization. But yet the, the, the reality turns out to be the other way around than they expected. And then the third world, when the global South sees that the China could actually manage to uh, achieve modernization and transformation despite the American sanction, it, it did deliver a huge morale boost. And a hands force proves that China could possibly be a alternative to, to a future world order. And now I'm not arguing that Chinese being the new world leader. No, it's precisely the other way around. China argues that by being an alternative, by setting up a Chinese style uh, modernization as an example for the rest of the world, the world could have a choice. And in this sense, having a choice is a defeat uh, is a, definitely a manifestation defeating the neoliberal uh, manifestation, which is there is no alternative but us. So in this case, uh, I think the Arab countries turning to China for a possible alternative is a very encouraging sign for the global South seeking for their own independent and sustainable development for the future. And that is a modernization which we all want to see, right? Essentially, we're not only just having a one model, but multiple order, uh, models for uh, and multiple sorts of support that the global South could choose from is definitely a much more promising multiplicity of the future development of 
globalization. So even though a lot of countries put trust in China, I wonder how much role can China play in solving this conflict, and what what kind of role? How big is the role that BRICS can play in mediating the conflicts? Yeah, sure. I really agree with the professor on the fact that this uh, the world order was the the end of history, and the you know neoliberal world order is finished. It's not, but it's becoming dangerous because as these like empires, when they collapse, they bring down civilization with them, and that's what is dangerous now. We could we have the prospects of a big war, either with Russia or with China. Some people advocating even a war with China now. So this is very dangerous. What we need is reconciliation in the world. I mean, I live in Europe. I'm European in a way. Uh, the Shell Institute, we are active in the United States and Europe. We don't want to have conflict between East and West or North and South. What China is doing is trying to is not trying to re reinvent the wheel. China says we have the United Nations Charter, the respect of sovereignty of nations. We have UN resolutions like the Resolution 242 from 1967, which uh, is you know to preserve the territories of the Palestinian uh, people and establish a Palestinian state. So it will be on equal footing legally with Israel. And then we need an international conference, uh, a new international peace conference. But what China is adding to that is the prospect of economic development for Palestine, for Israel, for the whole region. And that because of this region is also at the crossroads of the continents. It's very, very important that we have an economic prospect for stabilizing the situation. This is the Chinese wisdom. This is the Chinese method. This is something we fought for for many years in the Schiller Institute. I mean, when the, the Oslo Agreement was signed, uh, Mr. Lyndon LaRouche, the late American economist and the uh, husband of the chairwoman of the Schiller Institute, Mrs. Helgeser, he had this a plan called the Oasis Plan for economic reconstruction for the Palestinians, uh, for Israel, but also for Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Egypt. It's one big unit with infrastructure development. The most important thing is solving the water uh, shortage, which because Israel, many of Israel's wars was to control the water resources in the Golan Heights, in southern Lebanon, and so on and so forth. So there's not enough water. We need power. We even propose building small modular nuclear power plants for desalination of, of uh, seawater, uh, building uh, agro-industrial zones, greening, uh, greening the desert in in Palestine, in Israel, in Jordan, Egypt, and so on and so forth. So there is need for an economic platform which China is advocating, and it's completely, this our idea of the Oasis Plan is synergetic with the Belt and Road Initiative, especially the China, Central Asia, West Asia Development Corridor. Uh, and then you can expand that into the whole region because now China and the Arab countries and Iran are becoming very important economic partners. We saw this in last December in the China Arab Summit. Uh, we saw this in the special uh, strategic partnership agreement with Iran, which is a 25 year long-term plan and so on and so forth. So this is really what the issue now is, is to get first stabilize the situation, get a permanent ceasefire, because if you, have, if you don't have the war, Netanyahu will go to prison. Before this war broke out, this latest conflict, Netanyahu was on his way to prison, and many people in Israel are sick and tired of the regime they have, and they were fighting to change it. So this is a very positive thing. Only the Israeli people can change that inside Israel. But what the international community needs to do is what China is doing. Go back to the UN Charter, respect the sovereignty of nations, go back to UN resolutions, establish a Palestinian state, an equal state with everyone else, and then we have economic development. I think this would be the best possible solution. The BRICS, of course, the BRICS Plus, they have enormous in, uh, resources now. They can do that. But we hope that the United States and the EU will participate in this major peace plan, which is based on economic development, peace through economic development. This is our slogan. This is China's slogan. And I think everybody should work to make that succeed. Mm. Uh, Professor In, um, how do you see China's role or BRICS role in solving the ongoing crisis between Israel and Palestine? Uh, well, um, I'm relatively on the quite optimistic side of this argument. I think it is very, very promising, particularly after you've seen that President Xi Jinping made his announcement uh, or his remark on the, on the, on the BRICS special summit on the, over Palestine and Israel issue. And 
we have to see this as a very important milestone event. Why? Because, I mean, over the past few years since uh, the BRICS Foundation, BRICS has always only just been playing a role as an economic mechanism, as an economic infrastructure. It's nothing but just about development, economic cooperation, that sort of things. And the sort of the uh, the organizational arrangement of BRICS has always been revolving around that particular sentiment. We want to focus on economics. Um, the, 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 the new development bank is precisely that the brainchild of that initiative. But now we've seen that the BRICS has played, uh, has voiced its, its own concern, not only just as individual countries, but as a collective, you as a platform for a collective of countries uh, to announce their political concerns, their, their aspirations, political aspirations for the whole world. And that is a very promising sign to see that we, uh, the world has once again, going back to what Samuel Amin would argue, a negotiated globali globalization stage. Now, how do we achieve a negotiated globalization? We have multiple truly quality amount among multiple entities, right? We, in the past 40 years during the neoliberal um, um, uh, globalization, only the global north has its own agency. Only the global north has its uh, power to voice their um, concerns, to deliver their message on the international, or at least in a, um, in a very forceful way. But since uh, the, that, does not mean a true uh, negotiate globalization. The, the, the cultural diversity within a hegemonic power or beneath a hegemonic power is not diversity. It's just a, 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 a chicken or beef choices. It's a, a, it's a fallacy. It's illusion of diversity. But now you, you can see that the, the BRICS has played a much bigger role as if it's a counterweight towards the neoliberal international order, as Na a counterweight to NATO, a counterweight um, towards uh, the um, um, the um, um, uh, the United Nation being incapacitated by all those veto votes coming from uh, uh, from the United States or other countries. BRICS plays a role, but interestingly. You do see that BRICS is not saying that I'm not going to deal with United Nation at all. China once again bridged the BRICS and United Nation once again, and you do see the negotiation and co cooperation ongoing as an infrastructure, as a mechanism, truly pan out. But do you think India in, might be the unstable reason, unstable elements in BRICS? I mean, sure. I mean, people would argue that India as a strong state is very much a right-wing state that with Modi's government could play a quite interesting role. But having said that, when we are talking about a mechanism, we don't necessarily have to advocate an absolute unity within, uh, within, uh, within its, uh, among its participants, right? We want a collective initiative. We want consensus, and consensus can reach regardless of agree, uh, or even with disagreement. Um, um, the, the most important thing is that BRICS has been used as a political and as a moral, as an economic platform for negotiation, and that is very promising. If we have disagreements, have a disagreement in a very much civilized and organized way on a BRICS platform. Similarly, when you have the, when other global South countries have disagreements and have sort of quarrels, they have international mediation court to go to instead of just an international criminal court that has been dominated by um, uh, by the global North. Now there is choices. Of course, we have quarrels, we have disagreements. But fine, uh, great disagreements can be resolved in a different and uh, much more diverse way. We all welcome that. We have sort of, so I'm, I'm, I'm still quite positive on that. <laughs> Jose, what about you? Are you positive about BRICS or China? Yeah, well, I think BRICS and the, now the BRICS Plus is a very, very important institution. 
because it's built on sound basis on the diversity, uh, unity, uh, you know, harmony within diversity, uh, which is very, very important. Look at India and China. They're very completely different. But what is common there is that the universal aspiration to improve the living conditions of their population, get out of poverty and get onto the modernization process. I think India, they although there are sometimes you have some opportunistic uh, moves, but I think China, uh, India's long-term uh, policy is to integrate into Eurasia uh, and Asia generally. I mean, they are very important members, not only of the BRICS, but also of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, they are big uh, allies of both Iran and Russia, who are very important now uh, partners of China. So th th it's like you cannot change geography. You cannot change history uh, just because some political force are playing games. Look at the recent uh, you know, G20 where the United States pull, pushed pulled this whole thing about the India Middle East Europe corridor, which I I wrote a, a very sarcastic piece about, which is that this is a fraud, trying to pull India into something which is a bluff, uh, away from China, away from the Belt and Road, and also the both the Arab countries and Israel. But look what happened; it's dead now. You know, so it was supposed to go through Israel and you know the Palestinian territories, and it's. It was killed by Netanyahu and these uh, guys there. So this is, it's not a, a sustainable thing. It's not viable. There is much, much better alternative, which is in the BRICS, BRICS Plus, Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Belt and Road Initiative. I think India should join hands with China as the two largest economies in Asia and Eurasia. And I think that's where the future lies. And I'm very hopeful. I mean, all these problems on the border, these what. This is exactly what the British Empire created between Palestine and, you know, the Palestinians and the Israelis, the Arabs and, and Israel, between Arab countries. We have border issues until today. We have border issues between Pakistan and India, between India and China. But all the, these were all creations of the British Empire. And people have to wake up to the fact that this is was the intention is to divide and conquer, keep nations separate. And I think it's time to grow up a little bit get out of that infancy which belongs to the colonial period nations like with great history and civilization should be more mature in dealing with these things rather than you know having these quarrels thank you gentlemen like you mentioned many of the problems we're facing now are actually designed and created by the imperial powers decades ago and it's like you mentioned Hossein, the divide and conquer strategy so i think Global South nations, development nations realize that, and it's time for us to unite and put aside our differences to really unite and change the global order. So I really hope we'll see uh, an end of the hostilities and the conflict. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining me today. I hope to have you more back on this show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, have you signed up to my weekly newsletter yet? I've created a weekly newsletter on Substack. If you prefer reading news, if you prefer reading news about China and other international pressing issues, if you want to look beyond the mainstream talking points, make sure you subscribe to my newsletter. You will have your news delivered to your email. Do you want to be a content contributor as well? If you want to get your articles, your stories, your perspectives being published, let me know. Here is my email box, jjnewsletter at hotmail.com. Let me know. If you prefer watching short videos, you can find me on TikTok. My name on TikTok is I am Li Jingjing. If you prefer interacting, discussing with people from all over the world, you can find me on Reddit. My subreddit name is News with Jingjing. If you prefer watching long videos, you can always stay here on YouTube. And you know I'm very active on Twitter as well, right? I will put the links of all my platforms in the description. I've been working as a journalist in China for more than 10 years now. I report stories related to China and also other international issues, but voices like mine are often being neglected, censored, or even attacked by Western mainstream media. I don't know, maybe one day, these Western companies probably want to erase me from their platforms. So it's very important that you subscribe me on multiple platforms so you can always find me. Thank you so much for supporting me for such a long time. See you next time.